to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. We're just going to take the first two verses for our text. Going to use the title today, Look Who's Coming to Dinner. Sometimes there's excitement around an honored guest coming to dinner. I know it's a special, a special guest and a special meal when Michelle breaks out the, the nice china. You don't get to eat off of that very regularly. But uh, when that comes out, I know it's a special, special deal. Well, today we're going to see an honored guest at dinner. Would you stand with me? John chapter 12. The first verse says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Dear Father, we bow before you. We do thank you for this glorious, wonderful Lord's Day that you blessed us with. We thank you, God, for the beauty of the sun outside, but more especially the beauty of the sun inside, the S-O-N, your son, uh, inside, Father. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, the one coming, proclaiming Jesus as her Savior. I thank you, Lord, for not only her, but her whole family, uh, Father, that means so much to me. And, and I just thank you for them, and I ask you to bless uh, moving forward, bless them and bless the church, and, and uh, may we be mutually an asset to one another. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. I just ask for clarity of thought and speech, that your word goes forth, accompanied by your Holy Spirit, uh, anointed by uh, your grace, and uh, draw us ever closer to you, and save, save God, anyone that hears, that knows not Jesus as Savior. We give you praise and credit and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever had a desire to see the glory, power, and majesty of Jesus Christ displayed in dazzling fashion, look no further than this passage. In this text, we're allowed to see Jesus in His relation to Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, and what He had done in their family. What a thrill to know that we serve a God of such grace, glory, and power. We also see here what He is able to do for anyone who needs to be delivered from sin and death today. This passage shows us how Jesus can take you from the deathbed of your sins and give you a seat at His table. If you don't know the Lord, this passage will show you what you can do, what He can do for you if you'll come to Him by faith. If you do know Him, these verses will help you remember what He did for you when He saved your soul by His grace. So just for a few minutes, I'd like to try to preach on the thought, look who's coming to dinner. People are coming to see Lazarus. The one who had been dead, but yet is alive. Everybody knew word had gotten around that this one who had been dead had been called back to life. But I submit to you today, he's not the most honored guest at this table. As a matter of fact, Jesus is. There may be someone here today or someone that listens over social media that needs to be saved. I want to tell you that Jesus has come here to save you. There is hope and life offered here today in Jesus' name. In chapter 11, we see Lazarus died. He was dead, not sick, dead. When Jesus, early in the chapter, verse 11 through 14 there, Jesus is discussing this with His disciples, and they think that He's sick and taking rest, and Jesus clearly says, Lazarus is dead. Three more times in the chapter, it is clearly pointed out for us that Lazarus is dead. As a dead man, he is oblivious to his surroundings. He, in fact, is oblivious to the presence of the Lord when Jesus showed up there at the tomb, unable to respond to his surroundings. 
Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, says that the sinner is lost in trespasses and sins. That in that lost condition, the sinner cannot sense the presence of the Lord. He cannot respond to the things of God. He cannot enjoy fellowship with God. He is dead in that pitiful condition. Dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritually dead. Lazarus was physically dead. We're relating that today to one being spiritually dead. Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb to call him to life. And he has come here to this place today to call you out of death and darkness into light and life. He offers you light and life today. Lazarus had been dead long enough for the decay process to begin. In verse 39 of chapter 11, according to Mary, Lazarus had been dead four days. Long enough to be stinking. That's what she said. Lord, by now he stinketh. He's been dead four days. Listen, the point I want to make here is this. Dead is dead. Four days, four weeks. <laughs> dead is dead. In the New Testament, Jesus resuscitates three people. And I say resuscitates because he didn't raise them to glorified new life like his. He raised them back to physical life. Three people. The daughter of Jairus in Luke 8. The widow of Nain's son in Luke 7. And then Lazarus here in our text. All of these have one thing in common. They were all dead. None any more dead. None any less dead. They were just dead. This is a picture of sinners. Friends, there aren't degrees of dead, just degrees of decay. Lazarus had been dead long enough to stink. Four days. Just as the physically dead are good for nothing but to be buried, the spiritually dead are fit for nothing but hell. John chapter 3 says they're condemned already. Those that have not believed in Jesus are condemned already. Why? Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There are no degrees of spiritual death. Dead is dead. There are not those that are more dead because they have committed more sin. No sin separates us from God. Any sin, all sin. In the minds of all the people at the tomb, Lazarus is dead and gone. Nothing more can be done about it. Had this been any other situation, any other guest in the cemetery, I might have agreed with them. But there was a vast difference on that day. Jesus Christ was there. The giver of life was there. The others may have been ready to leave Lazarus in the grave, but Jesus wasn't. He makes all the difference. And He can make all the difference in your life today. He can bring you out of spiritual deadness and darkness to life and light today. He's the only one who can make that difference in that person who's dead in sin and headed to hell. If Jesus had not passed by where Lazarus was and called him to life, he would have rotted in that grave. And friend, you can try any method you wish. But if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't bring life to your dead soul, then you're doomed to hell. You're doomed just as well as Lazarus was. Jesus and Jesus alone makes the difference in the life of the dead sinner. Acts 4 and 12 said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I knew I'd be through with it the time I got there. But that's what it says. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He has just as much power to give spiritual life and meaning as he had to give Lazarus physical life. Let me say it a different way. Just as surely as he was able to give Lazarus physical life, he can give you spiritual life today. We may give up on folks like this crowd gave up on Lazarus. But thank God, Jesus does not operate like we do. When it looked like there was no hope, 
The Lord came to where Lazarus lay in darkness and He changed everything for him. What has He done for you? What do you need Him to do for you? That person that you've been broken hearted over, that person that you've been praying over and, and crying over and, and maybe it's gone on for weeks, months, maybe the months have turned into years, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Jesus is not willing to give up. You keep praying. You keep crying. You keep bringing a name before the Lord. And you keep bringing the Lord's name up before that individual. Maybe God's working behind the scenes to soften that heart and to make them ready. I can tell you that Michelle and I, along with others, prayed for 17 long years after we were married for her dad. It seemed hopeless. It seemed a lost cause. But God got His attention, saved His soul, radically transformed His life. And we still give Him praise and thanks for that. There's some things about the call of Jesus that I want to point out. First of all, Lazarus received a personal call. When the Lord Jesus came to that tomb and He called out at that tomb, I want to tell you that He issued a call that was very personal. He called specifically for Lazarus to come out of the tomb. What if He had stood there that day and simply said, Come forth. I believe with all my heart that graveyard would have been emptied. I believe with all my heart everyone in the ground would have come up. Everyone in that cemetery anyway would have come up. But He didn't. He called specifically for one individual, didn't He? Lazarus. Come forth. That call was for no one else on that day. But it was for Lazarus alone. It was a call destined for one man and one man alone. Now the Gospel, I want to tell you, is a call to individuals from a holy God. I know, I, I believe with all my heart that whosoever will may be saved. That's Bible. Romans chapter 10. I know that God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. However, I also know that that call of the Lord is an intensely personal call. When He comes calling for you, He will call you as an individual. He won't ask your mom or your dad See, when He came calling for you, He called your name, didn't He? He didn't call your mama. And I, I thank God for godly mamas and godly daddies. I thank God for it. That's why I thank God for TJ and Kim and bringing their family up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and every one of them as they're becoming of age. They're receiving Christ as Savior and only one left. <laughs> and I'm so thrilled about that. But what I'm telling you is when God came calling for Brittany, He didn't ask Him. He didn't ask TJ. They had already made their peace with God. It was her turn. You see what I'm saying? It's a personal call. He will come to you as an individual. He won't speak to your husband or your wife. When He comes, He'll come for you personally. How many of us could testify to that truth this morning that we personally felt His conviction and it was uncomfortable. And we felt His drawing. And it maybe was irresistible. I'll tell you my personal experience. I sat in a little country church about five rows back on a Friday night revival. And the man preached hell, hell hot. And for the first time in my life, I realized that from a church pew, I was headed there. But when the invitation was given, I gripped the back of that pew in the front of me. I gripped it to my knuckles turned white. I thought I was going to squeeze the top off the wood. And I made it. I thought I'd made it. The invitation ended. They said a closing prayer. And I hadn't moved. I hadn't got out in front of everybody. I was, you know, I didn't want to go in front of everybody. So I made it for the back door. Everybody knows the preacher's got to shake all the hands and all of that. I made it for the back door, rounded the corner, and went around a, 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 a car. And who'd I run into? The preacher had just been preaching. How'd he get out there? I don't know. He's supposed to be shaking hands. But there he was. 
And I just broke down. I said, God, I can't resist you, can I? And I began to pull my heart out to that, to that man of God, Calvin Gould. And he explained it in a way that a, that a young boy could understand. And I received Jesus Christ as my Savior in the parking lot, kneeling by the bumper of an old dirty car. You see, he came for me as an individual. You have your own story, but you know how it felt when the conviction of the Lord's Holy Spirit came to you and it made you uncomfortable and it drew you unto Jesus and how you felt when you let go of whatever it was that was restraining and holding you back and you felt that sigh of relief. I don't have to fight it anymore and I don't have to dread anymore God's Holy Spirit convicting me. I can be, I can be, I can be happy and centered in God's presence. Lazarus received a precise call. It was a personal call, but it was also a very precise, precise call. He was told exactly what to do. When Jesus called his name, he didn't leave anything in question. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't have to wonder. Lazarus didn't have to wonder what he wants. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus told him exactly what he was supposed to do. When he comes calling, there'll be no doubt as to what He wants you to do. When He comes calling, His call will be for you to come to Him. His call will be for you to believe on Him by faith. His call will be a call for you to repent of your sins and to turn to Jesus for salvation. When He calls, there'll be no doubt as to what He wants you to do. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Can you say that today? I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. What day? That judgment day. That day when I'm called into question to stand before Him. He's able to keep that which I have committed unto Him. He is my hope of salvation. Not what I did or what I said or the words I used. No, Jesus Christ is who I believe in. Jesus Christ is my hope of salvation today and throughout all of eternity because I know that He'll keep me and that which I've committed unto Him. Lazarus received a powerful call. It brought him out of death and darkness into light and life. It changed everything for this man. Such is the power of the Master's call. When the call of Jesus comes to a life, and when that call is heeded, it has the power to potentially change all of life forever. His call has the power to penetrate the blindness and the darkness of sin and awaken the lost person to the need of the Lord. His call can be painful, as I've already mentioned, but it is necessary. And in the end, it turns out to be the most blessed thing because it leads to salvation. Lazarus, getting back to our text now, has been raised from death to life. The table has been set. The honored guest has been invited. Now the crowd might have wanted to come to see Lazarus, but the honored guest is Jesus. But sitting at the table with Jesus, here is a man who has been dead for four days. But at the command of Jesus, he's alive. He's able to meet with and embrace his family and friends. He's able to have fellowship with those that he loves. Once again, he's alive. When a sinner comes to Jesus for salvation, that sinner is brought out of death and is made alive. In Ephesians chapter 2, turn with me. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins has quickened us together or made us alive together with Christ 
By grace are ye saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we in Christ can have fellowship with God. Now we are equipped to worship and glorify the God of heaven. Everything has changed. Just as Lazarus was alive, now we are alive. We had been dead, but now we're alive. And now we have an appetite. Listen, Lazarus, when he was dead, didn't eat. But now that he's alive, he's sitting at the table. He's ready to take in some, some nourishment. Here's another analogy. Now that we're alive spiritually, we're alive in Christ, we're ready to take in the nourishment of God through His Word, aren't we? We're ready to worship Him and to receive what He can uh, give us that we may grow. Have an appetite for the things of God now. When Lazarus came out of that tomb, he was still bound in grave clothes. The clothes, uh, bindings in which he was buried. Jesus issued a command that he was to be set free from those bindings. He's no longer dead. He's not to look like it, nor live like it. He's to have all the appearance of life. He's been delivered from death and all its bondage. This is just what those who come to Jesus for salvation experience. He loosens all the chains that bind us. He breaks the power of sin in our life and allows us to go free. Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, you're different. You're liberated. You're alive. You're saved. Don't live like, don't look like the same old lost man that you used to be. He liberates everyone that He saves. Praise God. And then, Lazarus had spent four days sealed up in a tomb, totally oblivious to his condition. Now that he's alive, he's seen sitting at the table and fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the most important part. Not the food he was going to eat, but who it was he was fellowshipping with at the table. Everything has changed for this man, hasn't it? He's sitting at the table with the Lord. You ever, you ever thought about that and thought how marvelous it would be to sit at the table, have sweet fellowship with the Lord? I want to read something to you. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. In other words, Jesus said, I will dine with him. What was Lazarus doing here? He was dining with Jesus. Jesus is inviting you and me to dine with him. He's inviting the lost people to believe on him, to place their faith in him, to be saved, and then dine with him. This is how it is for all those who know the Lord. He fellowships with us. He fellowships with us here and now. And he promises that we'll have fellowship with him on high in our new home throughout eternity. To think that he would take people, wretched, sinful, dead, in sin people, wash us in his own blood, save us by his grace, and then spend an eternity fellowshipping with us is a blessing too large for my mind. What a luxury is ours when we know the Lord is our personal Savior. So I'm going to ask you, has Jesus Christ ever showed up at the tomb of your life and called to you to come out? To come unto Him? Did you answer His call? Did you do what He said? Did you obey His call? Or are you still trapped in darkness? Lost and waiting? If you need salvation, Jesus is calling you. Please, please come to Him. If your relationship with Him needs some work, please come before Him 
and do what He's speaking to your heart to do. He can and will move you from the deathbed to the Master's table if you'll just answer His call today. Would you pray with me, dear Father, we bow before You. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word, for Your Son, Jesus. We thank You for loving us in spite of us. We thank You, Lord, for commending Your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Father, today I ask for Your Holy Spirit to go forth and convict and draw that souls might be saved, that Your people might be brought to the point of restoring relationships and fellowships. Father, I just ask for You to do a mighty work and we give You thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name.